One of the long time traditions of the college going process in this country is that the student's family bears the first responsibility for covering college costs. And we know that's an incredibly tall order, especially as college costs are prohibitive for most families, especially given, you know, the time period that we're in right now with COVID-19. So, Peter, what can you tell us about um, the expected family contribution and how it impacts families who need help? Well, the, the expected family contribution is derived from a, a very basic formula that takes a look first at the family's income and assets. And I stress income and assets, so because it's not just the amount of money that, that uh, you might report uh, as earned income in a tax return, but it can be the, the value of properties held. And, and they'll, they'll subtract from the family's income and assets the family's cost of living. So there, there are different uh, variables that, that come into play there in making allowance for uh, the size of the family and, and the, the expenses of the family and, of course, the, the, the costs of living for the family in, in their, their current circumstance. Got it. So then how is EFC or expected family contribution actually determined? Well, that's when it gets a little tricky. Um, the, the, the very first uh, methodology that's going to be in use here is the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. It's a federal document that is used to determine the family's eligibility for funding from the federal government. The federal government provides funding to each institution every year in the amounts of grants, loans, and campus work study opportunities for students. And then the institution will use that money, will allocate that money to the students uh, whom it is admitting. So the, the FAFSA is used by every institution to determine eligibility for federal funds. State universities will use the FAFSA as their own methodology to determine how the state institution itself might uh, provide additional assistance. And some private colleges and universities will use the FAFSA in the same manner. So let's, let's take a look at the, at the FAFSA. Again, it's a federal document. You can complete it as soon after October 1st of a given year as possible, and you will be using what we'll call the prior prior year tax return. So for students starting in college in 2021, uh, the tax return would, that would be in place here would be the 2019 IRS tax return. This again de determines the student's eligibility for grants, loans, and work study, um, and it's required by all colleges. And, and I, I add here that sometimes um, families will say, well, we don't really need financial aid, but our daughter's interested in, in uh, getting a merit scholarship. Uh, should we still be doing the FAFSA? Many institutions will require the submission of the FAFSA for any student who would be a scholarship candidate. So you need to uh, look at the not so fine print in, in the scholarship requirements when you're looking at the, the scholarships. Now, here's the thing. When you complete the FAFSA online, you will almost immediately get something that is called a student aid report. And the student aid report provides a summary of the information you've just provided, and you'll also get a number. And that number will be your expected family contribution. You will look at that number. You might like it. You might not like it, but you'll get used to it. But it, going forward, that'll be the number you carry in your head in terms of what you're thinking you need to pay for college because the government says that's what you should be able to pay for college. So the FAFSA is important to get started. Got it. So it sounds like it's pretty straightforward. Complete the FAFSA and then you're all set, right? Well, not quite. Um, <laughs> as I was observing you complete the FAFSA, you've got a number in your head and you think you're all set, you're right. However, if the student is looking at any private colleges, there's a very good chance because about 375 private colleges among the most selected private colleges in the country will also use a, a methodology called the College Scholarship Service Profile. Another, uh, another term for this is institutional methodology. So the, the way this works is that uh, this is a group of about 375 institutions that have some degree of commonality in, in, in their expectations of, of the information they want to see. So they, there's a common form. However, each institution in that group can customize that form with additional questions uh, or requirements that, that are peculiar to the institution. So whereas the FAFSA might have about 18 to 20 data points that families need to be addressing, when they complete it, the profile could have as many as 60 to 80 data points a much more granular form. Um, and 
you think about these two forms and the objective for, for the FAFSA and for the profile is to provide the expected family contribution, you think, well, they're coming up with the same answer. Most often they do not. In fact, it's quite likely the case, given the additional considerations of the profile, that the profile will show a higher family contribution than the FAFSA. And that, that can be ten dollars to $15,000 greater than the FAFSA. The problem here is not only that there can be a great differential between the FAFSA and the profile, but when you complete the profile, you get no feedback. You don't know what the result of your submission is until perhaps your student's been admitted. And this can be kind of jarring because if you're carrying one number in your head, you're thinking, well, according to the FAFSA, we should be able to, to provide $20,000 for our, our son to go to college and your son's admitted to college and you get a financial aid award that says you should be able to provide $35,000. Wow, <laughs> that's, that's a pretty big difference. And, and you just need to be prepared for that. The problem again is that the, the profile submission will not provide any feedback to you. And uh, you, you just need to make sure that, that you keep that in mind as, as you move forward with the, the applications you're submitting. Hmm. That's interesting. So what happens if a private college asks for both forms? And you know, based on what you just said, the outcomes can be so far apart. How do they determine what the final EFC actually is then? Now we're getting into the weeds a little bit, and, and I'm, I'm glad you asked because this is something that's not very transparent about the, the process, uh, at least in terms of consumers. The institutions, private institutions, exercise what is called differential need analysis. In other words, the financial aid and admission officers at these institutions can see the outcome of both applications, both the FAFSA and the profile. Then as they are looking at candidates, they can decide which of these methodologies they want to use to justify a financial aid for that particular student. For example, if they're looking at a student that they really, really, really like, and they want to make sure they can do the most possible to, to leverage that student's enrollment, then they'll probably use the FAFSA to justify a, a stronger financial aid award lower financial contribution from the family, more financial aid. If they like the student, good student, but not one of their superstars, they're going to admit the student and there's an acknowledged need on the part of the family, then they, they might decide to use the profile to justify more contribution from the family and less financial aid from the family. So differential need analysis is in place at colleges and universities. The problem is that families don't know anything about this until the very last minute when the student's been admitted, and then there's a discrepancy between what they expected to see and what they really got. So we have to work at trying to resolve that transparency question. 